Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher, and welcome to All About Canadian Books. Today, let's get to know author Ian Gill. Ian Gill is also an award-winning journalist, conservationist, and bookseller. Hi, Ian. Welcome to All About Canadian Books. Thank you so much, Crystal. Great to be here. Well, are you ready for your 10 quick questions? Oh, sure. I can probably answer about six of them. <laughs> okay. So first one, when was your first visit to Haida Gwaii in BC? Uh, it was in the early 80s. I emigrated from Australia to Canada in 1981. Um, and my first trip to Haida Gwaii was probably in about 82, 83. I don't remember exactly. But it was the first sort of serious wilderness trip I'd ever done in Canada. And boy, is it some serious wilderness. <laughs> so, Ian, I like I just can't imagine what was it like for you to be standing there among these thousand year old cedars? Well, it's it's something that um, you never actually really forget. You know, the first time you're among the giants, so to speak, and you know, a lot of um, indigenous people have made a very pointed reference to the fact that um, these are the equivalent in this part of the world of the great cathedrals of Europe, you know, and I was just writing recently um, uh, in a fictional piece that I'm doing about people comparing some of these big trees to Notre Dame, for instance, you know, um, and uh, but they're, they're naturally constructed and um, uh, probably not as fire prone as Notre Dame, as it turns out, ironically, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's hard not to be um, uh, awed, to be overwhelmed, and to feel that you're um, a very small part of a very la much larger proposition in the world. Yeah, and for those who aren't familiar, go to Google Images. It's it it's it's some pretty impressive imagery to look at. That's for certain. Sure. Ian, what do wild salmon mean to you? Uh, wild salmon are basically, a, apart from the big trees that we were talking to, the big fish, although they're getting smaller, um, you know, big wild salmon, wild Pacific salmon are really a touchstone species along with, you know, the big uh, Douglas firs and Western red cedars uh, and other great tree species of this region. Um, and they're more than just a fish. I mean, they're absolutely the bedrock of indigenous culture, but also all of our culture in this region of the world on the west coast of North America. You, you, fish were traded from San Francisco Bay to the north slope of Alaska all along this coastline. Um, the culture, the songs, the dance, the stories, the lore, the uh, trade, all of them were imbued with um, a reverence for and thankfulness for uh, the, one of the most incredibly complex and um, absolutely rich species you can find anywhere in the world. Okay. What made you decide to open an independent bookstore, Upstart and Crow? Well, um, they say if you want to make a small fortune, uh, start with a large one and open a bookstore. Um, uh, so yes, it was really to sort of uh, shrink my fortune was the intention. No, it was actually uh, my partner Zoe Grams and I, uh, she's in book marketing and publishing um, and uh, I've written some books and um, uh, written a lot of articles and have always had an interest in literature. Um, and an opportunity came up on Granville Island here in Vancouver to um, secure a, a uh, a retail space um, and it felt right. It felt to us, it was in COVID. Um, people were sort of turning inwards and closer to home. Um, you know, from a business proposition, it wasn't quite as crazy as it sounds. It's actually, you know, holding its own, but really it was an opportunity to think about how can we get important stories out into the world that aren't sort of hidden behind a ton of trash, you know, which is what you tend to get in big bookstores and, and, and or online. And we basically thought about what about a um, more heavily curated uh, um, bookstore in which um, there was no kind of slack, you know, in which there, you come in there, um, you might be challenged sometimes by not finding the airport thriller you thought you were going to find, but you can buy that at the airport. You know, we wanted to basically say, okay, literature is important. Um, 
bold new ideas and really incredible old ideas need to be in the world, especially at a time where we're re-examining everything. So it wasn't just opening a bookstore, it was opening a literary art studio where with COVID starting to hopefully recede, we're not just going to be selling books, but we're hoping to make really the, um, the site a kind of a, a hub and a destination for brilliant thinkers and, and new ideas and emerging voices and a kind of a cultural um, bright light in the city, frankly. I wish I lived closer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can always send things in the mail. We do that too. <laughs> but your bookstore sounds like a place that I would love to walk through and, and, and peruse. It just sounds incredible. <laughs> We're very fortunate that people come in and some people come in and go, mm, okay, and you know, they want an airport thriller and they leave yeah. you know, not getting what they wanted. But most people come in and actually recognize immediately that the curation, the, the themes that we curate around are not just fiction, nonfiction and poetry. I mean, they're around... Uh, issues of the day and issues of importance um, uh, uh, and also literature and translation, which is not read widely in Canada, which should be because they're brilliant ideas written by people who's, who, for whom English isn't their first language, translated into English and we should be sharing them more. And so um, it really is an attempt to kind of elevate the experience of um, being in a literary space. Uh, and that's what we're aiming for. And uh, we are, just to go back to your point about not living no, clear uh, nearby, we actually have a subscription service that we've just launched mm -hmm. now too. And, and people can subscribe and uh, tell us uh, what they want in a book or what their interests are. And then once a month, you know, we just choose a book for them. So it's a bit, you know, it's, it's a bit um, a, a risk on both sides, you know, like uh, what are they sending me now? And, and we're sitting there <laughs> buddy, and uh, saying, are they going to like it? But it's actually working out to be really good fun, you know, and, and uh, so that's another way in which we're trying to kind of change the rules a bit about how uh, these ideas get out there. And on that note, for the curious readers, what's a book that you think everyone should read right now? Um, so I'm going to be boring because uh, I'm going to go to the book that I always answer with. It's called Peace and Good Order. Uh, and it's written by Harold Johnson, who sadly died earlier this year. Uh, Harold R. Johnson, uh, it's a small book. Um, Harold was uh, an Indigenous uh, leader from an author and actually trained as a uh, lawyer at Harvard, uh, prosecutor and defence attorney working in northern Saskatchewan for much of his career. And he writes with just incredible clarity about how biased and impossibly sort of structured the colonial systems are against the interests of indigenous people. And um, uh, it's not an angry book. He doesn't point fingers. It's just very matter of fact and very clear headed about the fact that, you know, he was in this system um, uh, trying to help uh, people who were caught by the, 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 the justice system in his home communities of Northern Saskatchewan. And just how impossibly wrong our system is for the complexities, the culture, the histories and, and the traumas of uh, Indigenous communities in this country. And it's just such a um, wake up call. You know, uh, and it, it, it does both fill you with some despair about things like reconciliation, which have now just become government programs and empty words. Um, but it also fills you somewhat with hope about the fact that um, there are people thinking clearly about this and there is work to be done. There's real work. And, I, and Harold was also just a beautiful man and a great uh, person to be with. And so um, I, partly out of affection for him, but partly out of the fact that I think every Canadian should read Peace and Good Order. Um, that's the book that I would recommend uh, every time. Okay. And I'll put a link down below in the description box so um, viewers can order a copy of that. Terrific. Thank you for doing that. Pleasure. So what was the catalyst for you becoming a passionate defender of the environment and human rights? 
Um, I guess my time as a, I mean, I grew up in uh, Australia, um, kind of didn't go to school very much, spent most of my time surfing. Um, and so when I was surfing, I was going to remote coastal communities and everything else. And I saw a lot of the countryside that you wouldn't normally see, certainly sitting at a desk at school. Um, saw a lot of what was going on in Indigenous communities that I visited and just, um, I didn't become a radicalized or anything, I just became sort of really curious about um, land and land use. Uh, I, my first job as a journalist was actually as an agricultural reporter, so I spent a lot of time in the bush talking to cockies, as we call them, administrative farmers, um, mm -hmm. and some really good people, uh, and just trying to sort of figure out what was going on with um, how food was produced, how we looked after ourselves and how our communities functioned. And um, when I came to Canada, um, the Indigenous presence was much um, more visible, uh, for me at least. But also all the stories I started doing were about environmental issues and um, and. Indigenous voices were not much heard back in the 80s around these things. The Haida uh, being an exception, the New Chalmers being another one, they both put big protests in place against logging in their territories. And I just became kind of intrigued by that. Um, and I, I won't go on <laughs> except just to say, as a reporter for several years, I reported on this stuff. And then I thought, you know, um, I'm sort of telling the same story over and over again. And I'm kind of almost sick of the sound of my own voice about, you know, loggers versus environmentals, industry bad, government corrupt, blah, blah, blah. And I just felt like there was more to be done kind of in the game than just reporting on the game. So I quit journalism to, to get involved. Uh, and um, it's a decision I'm uh, both proud of and um, grateful for being able to make. Excellent. Okay. So if there was a genie in a bottle that was granting you three wishes, what would you be wishing for, Ian? Um, I'd be wishing for more listening and dialogue to occur than does. Um, we have a system that now is very poor at listening. Um, I would also wish for uh, much bolder action to be taken. You know, uh, the, the times demand it, the newer generations demand it. We are not responding quickly enough. Um, and I would wish for more kindness in the world. Yeah, yeah. me too, me too. Who is your greatest teacher? My greatest teacher? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that before. Um, but in all honesty, I'd have to say probably my mother, uh, because she was a free spirit and um, uh, a, a kind of quiet radical in her own way. And just before she passed away, I helped her uh, write a book about her life and uh, was actually surprised and somewhat shocked at some of what she got up to that I didn't even know about. <laughs> so, um, so that was kind of revelatory and uh, surprising and encouraging and inspirational and so I'd have to say yeah um, uh, my mum was a very very good teacher um, in ways that were very subtle but uh, stay with me today. Of all of your accomplishments and this is the last question by the way what are you most proud of? Um I honestly don't know. I don't sort of spend a lot of time feeling proud. Uh, oh. I do think that um, uh, the relationships that I've been able to create uh, and sustain over years are really important to me and I think um, say something about me. I'm not quite sure what, but I'm... Um, you know, it's not like you know, I, I, I sort of count my friends or anything. Um, it's not like how many likes I get or anything like that. That doesn't mean anything to me at all. But the sort of deep relationships uh, across generations and across cultures um, are probably where I feel most comfortable and therefore what I'm probably most proud of. Ian Gill. Thank you so much for answering 10 questions so we get to know you a little better. I appreciate your time. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. And for viewers, don't go away because Ian will be back and we'll be talking about his book, All That We Say Is Ours. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to my channel, All About Canadian Books. 
and peruse all my other author interviews. Thank you so much. Bye.